Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to turn to the book of Romans, chapter 5. Heard a story of a man that was applying for a job, an entry-level job. As an engineer, the hiring manager asked him, what kind of salary would you like to make for this job? And he said, well, I think I should make at least 100000 and get benefits. And she said, well, actually, this job would start out at $150,000, two months of uh, benefits, or two months of uh, vacation and full benefits. And he said, you got to be kidding me. And she said, yeah, I am. I am. (laughs) So in that case, this man was expecting many, many benefits, and yet there weren't that many. But in our case, as Christians, as we think about salvation, there are are many, many benefits to being a Christian. It is amazing. It's hard to fathom just how much God has loved us, that the grace that he has given to us. And so this morning, I thought we could talk about that some, talk about some of these benefits that we receive as Christians. And so what better place than Romans chapter 5? Martin Luther has said of chapter 5, in the whole Bible, there's hardly another chapter which can equal this triumphant text. And so this is uh, hopefully just going to be an encouraging two weeks as we walk through some of this chapter. So let's begin our time just reading through it. We're going to read starting in verse 1. It says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were sinners, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Let's pray. Father, we are just grateful for this passage I'm just grateful for this time that we can have just to go through your word. We pray that you would bless this time, um, bless the hearers. Um, We pray that you would help me as I proclaim your word. We pray that all of us, as we hear this, would, would not just be hearers only, but doers of the word. We thank you for your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So now let's turn our attention to the first verse here. It says, therefore, having been justified by faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're starting in chapter 5. Obviously, there's many things that have happened beforehand, and it does have the word therefore. So what had happened before was Paul was talking in the first few chapters about how we all sin, how we all fall short of the glory of God. He really gives a case for our condemnation, that the need we have to be judged. Um, Then it talks about our justification. And so those are the two main themes that happen. Now, I want to walk through those some as we go through this first verse. Um, You'll notice right away just that verse 1 is a great verse to use for evangelism. This is a very good, very concise summary of the gospel. So it says here, therefore, having been justified by faith. So I thought we'd be helpful just to walk through for a moment this idea of justification. This is going to be a reminder for many of us, but also very helpful just to think through the gospel, to think through our salvation. So this word justification, it means to acquit or 
to vindicate or even um, to pronounce righteous. And so it's really a courtroom kind of term, a judicial kind of term. Here's a quote. In justification, God clears those who have been charged with sins or failures. The Bible makes it clear that God will clear no one of the charge of sin on the basis of his or her efforts to keep the law. One can be justified or declared righteous only on the basis of faith. So you think about the word justification. is that the idea of being declared right before God or to be declared righteous. And so then the question we can ask then is, well, why? Like, why do I need that? Why would I need to be justified or declared right before God. I mean, I'm not that bad. I'm a, I'm a good guy. I'm not Hitler. I'm a, I haven't killed anyone. Maybe that's something you're thinking. Well, the Bible gives a very different picture of why we need this justification. And so the Bible describes us actually as formerly before, before Christ, we were enemies of God. Listen to some of these verses. Verses 1, Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So this is talking about God's wrath being revealed against those who are not in Christ. Even just a little later, Romans 5.10, it says, For while we were enemies, so before Christ, before our reconciliation, the Bible describes us as God's enemies. That's pretty extreme. Romans 8, 7, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. So the mind of the unbeliever is hostile towards God. And the people of the world, they hate the light because the light reveals the evil deeds. They they don't want to go to the light. They want to stay in the darkness. Colossians 1 says, although you were formerly alienated, and hostile in mind, and doing evil deeds. So that the person outside of Christ, all people are alienated, they're hostile in mind, doing evil evil deeds. You flip back just to Romans 3, this is kind of the classic text that people go to to, to show how depraved mankind is. Verse 10 says, As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. So no one, not one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks out God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good. No, not one. That's comprehensive. No one. No, not one. There's not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and they have not known the way of peace. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is a good summary of our world, isn't it? There's no fear of God, no, no recognition of God whatsoever. Titus 3.3, 3, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated it by others and hating one another. So this is Titus. He's speaking to the church, uh, and he's saying, this is how we used to be, outside of Christ. Ephesians 2, and he, and you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which he once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves and the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, by nature, children of wrath. So you think about that. It's pretty grim. It's pretty sober to think about people apart from Christ are children of wrath. It says that their father is the devil. I'll just mention a few other sins. Just see if you've done any of these. Anger, lust, stealing, lying, coveting, gossiping, complaining, Pride, green, la- uh, greed, laziness, envy, gluttony, bitterness, unforgiveness, boasting, not obeying parents, drunkenness, the list goes on. And I think if we're all honest, we can see that we've all committed these sins. So we are all sinners. But not only that, we are all born into sin. So Romans 5, 12, therefore, 
Just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. So you can see here, just through being born of Adam, we were born into sin. And so we are sinners by nature, but then we are sinners by choice as well. And so the Bible teaches then that that sin demands judgment. It, it demands condemnation is the idea there. We need punishment for our sins because our God is a holy God. And our God is the creator of the universe. And he demands perfection. And so some may say, well, I don't want to have to do what he, has, he tells me to do. I just want to do what I want to do. Why do I have to obey God? I just want to live my life and have fun. Well, God is your creator. He's the one who keeps you alive. He sustains your existence. And so he, we need to obey his commands. That's what, who God is. And so people, obviously, they don't like this at all. They don't like to be told what to do. But it is because of God that you're here today. So how does this work then? How, how, um, how can we be justified? So we think back to this verse. It says, therefore, having been just, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we saw that, that we all need it. We all deserve punishment because we've all sinned. But this here it gives us the how. It says, we have been justified by faith. And it says, through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's really good news. That's really encouraging. It's really exciting. So what's going on here? So let's give an example. Let's think about this. Let's say there's a man who robs a bank, steals millions and millions of dollars, and then he gets caught, but he's already spent all the money. He's just wasted it. So he goes to the court, and the, the judge says, you owe millions of dollars. Unless you pay $100 million, you're going to be thrown into prison for the next 20 years. And so this man says, well, I, I can't pay that. I can't do that. Now, let's say suddenly another man walks in. He whispers to the judge. And then the judge says, actually, you can go free. And the man says, why, why can I go free? He said, this guy just paid your debt. Debt paid in full. You're free to go. Okay, that's kind of a similar example of the gospel. This uh, justified by faith through Christ. So what happened with Christ is that he paid on the cross the penalty of our sins. He paid it in full. He bore the wrath of God. And so that punishment that we deserve, he took on himself. And so by faith, by trusting in what he did, then we can be saved. And the cool thing about this is is not only is our debt, our sin debt paid in full, but also we are credited with Christ's righteousness. So it's like, it's almost like this. You owe a hundred million dollars of debt, pays it off, and then he says, now here's a credit card, and it's an infinite limit. You spend as much as you want. Here you go. So that's grace. And so by faith then in our Lord Jesus Christ, we can be justified. That is great news. Because we all sin. We all fall short. So what does that look like? Well, it looks like repenting. So turning from your sins, doing a 180, and putting your, uh, your faith and trust as Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Notice that. It says, through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that, that's the idea that uh, he's Lord. He is master. He is in charge. It's, it's like that song that we sang last week. I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender everything. You're giving your life totally, 100% to Christ. You're trusting in him for salvation. And so in doing so, we can be saved. And it says here, and then we have peace with God. And that is just an amazing thing to consider, to have peace with God. So verse 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So placing our faith, our trust in Christ, repenting of our sins, we can be justified. It's as if we never sin. Not only is it that we never sin, but we are credited with Christ's righteousness, and it results and are having peace with God, even though beforehand we were his enemies. So this peace, this term, is the idea of binding together something that was broken. It's, it's making a, a right relationship. It really points us, as we'll see at the end of the text, of this chapter, or this section, um, to this idea of reconciliation. 
So you think about what is reconciliation is when two parties are like this, they're having conflict. Think about a marriage, a husband and wife, they're separated, they're struggling. And finally the two get together, they confess, they, they forgive each other. And then there's true reconciliation. The couple comes back together and there's peace in the relationship. So that's what's going on here. So we have peace with God. So here's a helpful quote. The basic meaning of peace is reconciliation with God through the death of his son. This implies the, the removal of divine wrath from the sinner and the latter's restoration to divine favor. So even though we were, as Colossians says, we were formerly alienated and hostile, we were engaged in evil deeds, it says here, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach. So that peace with God is an amazing benefit, an amazing blessing to think about that the wrath of God is no longer upon us, that we don't have to worry about that, that that has been paid in full, to think that we can now have a right relationship with God, that we even can call him our father our heavenly father, that we have been adopted into the family of God. Later in Romans, Romans 8, it says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So because of the work of the cross, our sin debt was paid in full. It is finished. And that results in peace between us and God. So it reminds me of the song, but probably all of us saying, I got peace like a river. I got peace like a river. I got peace like a river in my soul. You guys remember that? I'm not going to sing it. Don't worry. But uh, it's a good song. We, it gives us peace in our soul. It gives us a clear conscience knowing that, yes, we offended God, but he forgave that. It's paid off. You know, I think about sometimes with my children, I have to remind them that when they forgive someone, when there's conflict with the siblings, True forgiveness means you don't bring it back up. It's done. You forgive like God does. You, you never think about it again. You never talk about, talk about it again because it's forgiven. It's done. And so in this case, we have been forgiven. Uh, we have, can have a clear conscience. And this is all a free gift simply by putting our faith and our trust in Christ. And not only is it peace with God, but it results and the peace of God, so with God and of God. So you think about that. If we can trust God for saving us from hell, for, for an eternity in hell, we trust God for our soul, the salvation of our soul, then the least we can do is trust God in this life. These little things that aren't that big a deal to God, we can trust that he is in control. I remember hearing a story of a lady who asked the man, she said to the man, I, you know, I really try to, mainly just pray for the big things when I'm praying to God, because I don't want to, you know, I know he has a lot going on. And the man said, lady, there are no big things for God. These are all small things that you're asking for, every single one of them. They may seem big to us, but to God, it's nothing, because he is awesome. He is powerful. He is sovereign. And so we can have this peace, this um, peace that surpasses all understanding. And so it is an amazing benefit. It's just we are truly blessed by that. Now, we see another benefit in verse 2. Not only do we have peace with God, but because of then of this peace, because of this reconciliation, we now can have access to God as well. So look at this in verse 2. It says, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. So this word introduction, it could also just mean um, we obtain access it's an unhindered access to the sanctuary as the place of God's presence. Another quote. He, cl- he clothes him with himself as his righteousness. He cleanses him in his own precious blood and brings him into the full favor of God the Father. So an example of this. It would be like you're a peasant. You're waiting in line for hours to see the king. And suddenly some stranger says, hey, come with me, and you come with him. He cleans you up. He gives you a fresh pair of clothes. He brings you straight to the courtroom, straight to the room uh, where the king is. And then he says, here, you can talk with the king. And they says, how did you get me in here? He said, this is my dad. 
This is the king. So that's how it is with Christ. He gives us access. To, through Christ, we can have access to God the Father. We see this in a few texts. Ephesians 2.18, it says, For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Um, 3.12, In whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered for sin once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that he might bring you to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. You can think about uh, just the time in the Old Testament, the high priest uh, going into the Holy of Holies and just having to be extremely careful. And even so, if they, if they made a mistake, they would be killed. And just think about that, the difficulty in a- accessing God's presence. Even so much so that they would wear bells and be tied by a rope just to make sure in case they died, they could drag them out. Well, think about that context. Now, notice what the author of Hebrews says verse, in chapter 4, verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us take hold of our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things like we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and grace to help in the time of need. In chapter 10, he continues this this idea, verse 19. It says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest Over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This also reminds me of another song. I won't sing it again, but a song we sang here last week as well, I think. It says this, we've sung it before. It says, this is the art of celebration, knowing we're free from condemnation. Oh, praise the one, praise the one who made an end to all, to all my sin. Boldly, I approach your throne. Blameless, now I'm running home. By your blood, I come, welcomed as your own, into the arms of majesty. So that's just a, a great song, really hitting on the themes here, that we now, through Christ, can have access. We, we have obtained this introduction by faith and the grace of in which we stand. So we are standing in this grace. Think about grace. Grace is just a gift. It's unmerited favor. And it's like we get to stand in it. And it's a wonderful blessing, another great blessing from the Lord. And on the side note, great song, Barry. Good job. Good biblical lyrics. Thankful for that here at the church that we just have solid uh, lyrics in our music. So not only do we have this access to God, but we also have here just an amazing hope. A glorious hope. Notice what it says. It says, Through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. So exult there, really just the idea to rejoice. We are rejoicing in the glory of God. And I think that's pointing to the future glory that we will receive, that we will take part of. Colossians 3.1 says this, it says, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ. So he's saying here, think about, just like this text, the eternal things. Have an eternal perspective on life. And then it says, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. So you can see that. That's speaking of ourselves, of our our own glorification when Christ comes. And so we rejoice then in this hope of glory. And this hope here is not like the the hope that we often will say, like, I hope he comes. Um, This is a a confident expectation. We are resting in this. We are awaiting in this, confident that it will happen. So we rejoice greatly when we reflect on the solid basis for the expectation of future bliss. So that's another quote there. 
So this should just cause us to rejoice knowing that we have this eternity in heaven with Christ. And so this is another great benefit as we think about the benefits of being a Christian. Now, we have a, a new benefit. Now, this one's really kind of strange, actually. We probably wouldn't expect this. It's probably something you would never hear from a non-Christian. But it's a, says here, we really see the idea of rejoicing in our tribulations. So because of our justification, because of our salvation, we can rejoice even in the hard times, even when trials come our way. Look at verse 3. It says, not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. So you can rejoice in a trial, in a, a difficulty. You can rejoice in suffering. That is so hard. It's hard to fathom. Well, the Bible says that God's power is made great in our weakness. We can see that as you walk through Paul and his thorn in the flesh. You know, Paul kept asking him, the Lord, please you know, take, remove this from me. And God said no. He answered his prayer, and he said no. And Paul said, well, I'll just go with what the Lord said. If he, he's the one in charge. I will trust in him. God gave him that difficulty. And so in our case, the Lord gives us trials. You know, I think about just being a parent, think about my children, you think about this idea here of blessing. And I want to bless my kids. I like to give them gifts. I like to give them good things. But as you all know, especially the parents in the room, sometimes you have to give tough love, the gift of tough love, the gift of discipline, because we know it's for their good. And so the Lord does that as well. And for us as believers, we can rejoice even when we face hardships. Why? Because we know what it's producing. We know what it's doing in our lives. So what does it do? Well, it says here, knowing that it brings about perseverance. So as you face a trial, it helps you to persevere through it. It helps you to be more patient. It's kind of like they, they always say, never pray for God to help you to be patient because then he'll give you trials and then you'll learn and you may not want to learn that. But that is a great benefit that as we face challenges, as we face hard times, the Lord helps us. He helps us to grow through those things. Not only perseverance, but then it says proven character. So this is the same kind of word used in James and used in First Peter. It's this idea of, of testing a metal. So you take the metal, you throw it in the fire, you see what comes out. And that's what, pers- that's what suffering, that's what trials does for us. And as we go through that trial, it gives us proof that our faith is genuine that our faith is real. And so oftentimes we, we come across people who face very serious trials and two things happen. They either fall away or they grow even stronger in the Lord. And so it is very helpful for us. I'm sure all of us can relate who have faced challenging trials to be able to go through that and still trust in the Lord and be even stronger as a result of it. You can see this in the example of Timothy Philippians 2.22, he says, you know of his proven worth, so he's talking about Timothy, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. So that word there, proven worth, is the same word here for character. So think about Timothy. I mean, imagine you are following around the apostle Paul, and you're one of his disciples, and Paul Every, pretty much every city he gets thrown into prison or he's going to get beat by webs or something terrible is going to happen to him. And yet Timothy was a man, he was faithful. He was faithful to follow Paul. And it, he really showed that proven character. You see this in James. It says, blessed is a man who perseveres under trial for once he has been approved, the same term there, to be approved, that character term, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. First Peter, same idea. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So similar to this context in Romans, difficulties, hardships. It says, so that the proof, same term again, the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is parable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So as we go through these challenges, as we go through these trials, it helps us. It shows that our, that our faith is real and it gives us even more assurance, even more hope for the return of Christ himself. So verse five continues and says, and hope does not disappoint 
Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So hope does not disappoint. Another blessing is just this love of God. It's poured out through the Holy Spirit who has been given to all of us. And here, there is, there's no disappointment if we hope in God, we trust in his promise because we got his love poured out within us. This is helpful in their quote. God's inexhaustible supply of love is poured out generously by the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Whatever happens to us, we are surrounded by his love. So as we look at this, these few verses, it just really is amazing to see the blessings, the benefits of our justification, of our salvation. To know that God is sovereign, that he is in control, that he loves us, that he takes care of us. That through faith in Christ, we can have peace with God. And not only that, we can have access to the Father. And not only that, but we can rejoice even in the hard times, even in the trials and tribulations, knowing that the Lord is using that to help us to grow, to, to strengthen our faith, to show if our faith is real or not. And not only that, we have this great love of God that has been poured out upon us. So we, we have so much to be thankful for. And so I would just recommend, I would challenge really all of you and me as well, you know, are you thinking of these benefits daily? Are you trusting in God? Are you thankful to God for your salvation? I know for me, it's so easy to just forget. You get in your daily life, you get busy, you get stressed, you got things going on. And it's like the song says, you know, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look fully into his wonderful face and the things of his world will go strangely dim. So focusing on Christ is so important. So let's stand now and um, let's, let's pray and then we'll have a time to remember Christ even more in this Lord's Supper. Father, we are just, again, we are grateful for you, grateful for our salvation. It is such amazing grace. And as we saw at the very beginning, we don't deserve it. We never have. And, you, and yet you sent your son while we are yet sinners, as this text says, to die for us. And so we just, it is amazing, and we thank you for it. And we just pray that as we go about our lives every day, that we, we would be mindful of this, and that we'd be thankful for it, and that we would live for you to bring you glory, honor, and praise. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.